And uh, Charlie and had preached here for a number of years, a number of years ago. And Charlie May and uh, Uncle Herschel both served as elders here. And there are a lot of good Christian men who could be here today, but I chose these three, and I'm thankful that they have uh, have elected to uh, to join the the crowd this morning and and be a part of this class. I was thinking about the Apostle Paul, and when you think about Paul. There are a lot of things about him that you could talk about that would not be a comparison to any of these three at all. Paul was a persecutor of Christians and had lots of troubles in that way. But understanding that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and at some point we became Christians and are trying to live for God and and do the things that are right. And in that aspect, I want you to think about Paul because in Acts chapter 9 as he was on his way to deliver folks to prison, then there was something that happened to him and which resulted in him going to the city. You remember the great light shined round about him and he went into the city and he was told there what he should do and he was told to arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. We know about that. And Paul talked about that from that point on, from Acts, in Acts chapter 9 when it happened. And then again in Acts chapter 22 when he was making his defense to the Jews. And then again in Acts chapter 26 when he was before the king that's all Paul wanted to talk about. And, and I think that's something that's interesting and something that, that really we might need to think about some more as far as whose we are and who we are as Christians and children of God and brothers and sisters in the kingdom of God. And so we think about those kinds of things. You know, Paul went on at least four missionary journeys and he visited over 60 cities. And everywhere he went, the message was similar to 1 Corinthians 15 where he says, I declare to you the gospel uh, that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And so for the rest of his life till the day that he died, Paul was talking about teaching and telling folks about God, Christ, the church, and about who he was before he became a Christian and now who he is because he's a Christian. And, and, and we sing the song, Isn't It Grand to Be a Christian? We talk about it being a grand thing to be a Christian. There's reasons for that. There are reasons why we get to say it's grand to be a Christian. There's reasons why you and I should be joyful people. There are reasons why you and I ought to be at the top of the stack every time when it comes to spirituality, when it comes to faithfulness, when it comes to all these good things. And I thought, you know, who better, again, than the voice of experience? And as I talked to these gentlemen on the, on the phone and I asked them, you know, they were a little bit, I'm going to say a little bit reluctant to begin with, but they managed it okay. And they're sitting here today and we're going to, we're going to love them and support them. And, and the question that I asked them and I wanted them to kind of prepare their thoughts for, I didn't tell them all the questions because I wanted to get some, uh, some immediate re- reaction from uh, what I might have to say and let them just kind of say what they think right then. But I did ask them to think about what it meant to be a Christian to them and how important Christianity has been in each of their lives and, and, and the things that, that they've had as a result of living for Jesus for so long. I'm going to say in the number of years, we've got two of these gentlemen who are in their 80s and one in his 90s. If you add all that up, that's a long time that they've been alive and some of the changes that they've seen physically in this world, but the opportunities is what I wanted them to talk about today and the blessings of being a Christian. Have y'all worked it out on who's going to be first? Uncle Hershey, you want to go first? Okay, all right. Dad's going to go first. The preacher's going to go first, okay? All right. We look forward to hearing from you all, and, and I'll share some thoughts and ask some questions later. Hold it up a little close to your mouth, Pop. I want everybody to open your Bible to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. If you found your place, we're going to read verse 4, 5, and 6. What I'm going to do, what I'm trying to do is to get us to appreciate what we are because of what we are. 
So Paul here, including himself, in verse 4, in Romans chapter 6, in verse 4, Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the, by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. What Paul is saying here is, that we were baptized into Christ and that we were buried with him in baptism. So when we went down into the watery grave of baptism, we went down in with Christ. So Christ was raised up by the Father from the dead. We also were raised up a new creature to walk in newness of life. Not the same person. Not the same person that went into the water. But a new creature in Christ. Because in verse 6 he says, the old man is crucified are put to death. So we are not the same person as we were when we went into the watery grave of baptism. And then I want you to look at at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Verses 13 and 14. Who, that is God, hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have Redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of our sins. So God has delivered us from the power of darkness. He has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. The kingdom that Jesus told Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now we are in that kingdom, and he called it the kingdom of his dear son. So I want to ask you this morning, are you happy to be a member of his, the kingdom of his dear son? I just wanted us to see where we are and to see if we can say that we are happy as Christians. And all three of us are here to talk about what it means to us to be Christians. So let me let Herschel tell us first since he's probably been a member of the kingdom old, uh, longer than any of us because he's a little bit older than we are. So, Herschel, if you'll tell us. 
Thank you. Well, the question was, what did the church mean to you, or what did Christ mean to you? Well, to me, it's being getting a chance to go to heaven. I want to meet mother and dad again. Mother is the first one that taught me about Christ. No, I remember when I was a, just a boy, she'd give me a penny to drop in the place at Antioch. And I promised uh, the good Lord then that uh, I'd get Brother Camel to baptize me in, in fresh water in Rich and Creek or either blue water. But it didn't, that didn't happen. When I was baptized, I was up here in uh, white shoes. The preacher was wore white shoes all the time. I don't remember his name. He was? Oh, uh, good. And uh, so, boy, he preached, and I didn't know enough, but I came up here, and guess who was there beside me in no time? Bessie. I never was so happy in all my life. And ever since, she's been nothing but a booster to me. So it means a great lot to me to be in the church. I know most all the old people, and I love all of you, and I don't know one of you that is a sinner, really. I don't guess, I hope it ain't. So I appreciate y'all, I love you. And uh, I want to go to heaven more than anything. And like I say, I want to meet all my friends, especially mother and dad. I want to read just a little bit in the Bible. First John 4. First John 4. This is about love. Oh, and I think we need it. First John four. Hold your microphone up. Oh yeah. First John four seven. Seven first. Beloved, let us love one another, for the love is of God. And every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not God, for God is love. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was it manifested that the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be a participant for our sin. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. I want to read that again. Beloved, if God loved us, we ought to love one another. No man has seen God at any time if we love one another. God dwells in us, and his love is perfect in us. So I love every one of y'all, and I want y'all all to love one another, just like it says here. And we'll all go to heaven together. Thank you. All right, Brother Horace said, uh, Miles asked him this morning if he was nervous. He said, no. I said, I can't say that. <laughs> All right. What the church has meant to me, I can sum that up in seven words. It has meant all the world to me. If it hadn't been for the church, I'd hate to think what I might have been. I could have been a drunkard. No telling what I could have been if I'd never become a member of the church. Now, I've been a member of the church about 72 or 73 years. Well, Brother Langster from Tennessee baptized me when I was about 14 or 15 years old. Down in below the Blue Water Bridge where Camp Branch runs into the Blue Water. So I've been a member at least 72 years, maybe even 74. I'm not sure. But I'd have to give Brother Horace the credit for what I am today. 
and he was preaching at Antioch about 1962. He taught some lessons on elders and what have you. Of course, Antioch didn't have no elders at that time. And he preached some sermons on that. They had a meeting. I don't know how come we, who pointed who or who mentioned what. But Brother Albert Greenhill, Brother Olden Smith, Brother Oscar Davis, myself, was pointed as elders. That is Antioch. And I served out there approximately 12 years. And I've served here 70, 37 years, four or five days. So I've been an elder about 49 years. I've seen a lot. I've witnessed a lot. I've spent uh, sleepless nights and what have you. So I'd hate to think what I might have been if it hadn't ever been for I'd never been a member of the church. I saw a lot of changes in the church in those 70-something years. I can remember when the Lord's table had linen on them. How many of you can remember that? All right, they had one linen on the table and the Lord's Supper, and they covered the Lord's Supper with the linen. Now, when they stopped that, well, there's a lot of people against that. There's a lot of confusion over that. But also another thing I can change, I can see, is concerning prayer. If you're called on to lead a prayer, I don't care where you were sitting or where in the middle of the pew or whatever, but you made your way out to the aisle and got down on your knees to lead the prayer. Antioch had what they called a man's comer. I believe it was about three short benches over to the right of the pulpit. I can just see all of them old gentlemen that sit over there and led prayer. My granddaddy and Mr. Will Smith, Bill, uh, Mr. Well, I'll think of it in a minute. Richard Hamley, Bill, B, uh, Bill Williams, them was all old gentlemen. And they'd get out on the floor and kneel down to lead their prayer. So I've been reading a book lately concerning unity in the church. And I'm surprised of how many different passages applies to the unity in the church. Even the Old Testament, New Testament, what have. Two of the most familiar verses is Psalms 33 and verse 1. Where he says there, Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So it is a pleasant, it's beautiful. Also in 1 Corinthians, another real popular verse, 1 in verse 10. Paul said, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no division among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, the same judgment. Now, there's two key words in this verse is all and perfect. So that means all. Everyone should be in agreement. I hate to see a church that's divided. I read in that book where they had a church that was divided. One group sat on the right, one on the left. They had two different heaters, two different coal piles, and such as that. And that's a shame that such as that would exist in the church. And this fellow came in and carrying a chair, he sat down in the middle. And he says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and two coal piles. So I thought, I thought he, he ought to have got the over pretty good for him. So I'm proud of the church at Atlas. I ain't been having this thing at the right place. I'm proud of the church at Atlas. I know we're not perfect, but I think we're above average. In fact, I know we are. I uh, hope and pray that we'll all always stand for the truth. We've got good elders. We've got good ministers. At one time, a few years ago, I understand that we were the largest country congregation in the United States. And I don't think we're too far from that now. I believe we can get back to that if we all try. And so that... I enjoy the church. I like the church. I love the church. 
I love everyone. May God bless all of you. I appreciate what y'all have had to say so far. Just in, in reacting and thinking about some things, I wrote down some questions. Uncle Herschel mentioned his mother encouraging him. And Charlie May, I know you mentioned dad. has uh, He encouraged you some. And I know mother encouraged daddy. He used to walk to church with her and sit out on the wagon and whittle just to get to go to church with her. But I think uh, she was instrumental in, in, uh, in helping him. Sir? No, sir. We got about 20 minutes. We got about 20 minutes. Are you wanting to preach this morning? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, let me, let me ask a question, Dad, and, and, and let's see what you think about this. Why did you become a Christian? Uncle Herschel said he wanted to go to heaven. As you were in the process, if either of you want to respond to that, when you were learning and why, when you were hearing the gospel, why did you become a Christian to start with? I, I, I didn't grow up in the church. In fact, I was not a very good person. In fact, when my wife married me, my mother-in-law did not want her to marry me. And I, I can understand why, because I was a rebel rouser. But when I, I had, I, well, I just wasn't brought up to, uh, to believe in in God and Christ, and and so when I went to the church the first time, I really liked what I heard, and so we went back. The second time, the first time I went, Louise said, we got up one Sunday morning. She said, I'm going to church. She hadn't been going. And so she said, I'm going to church. And so I didn't want her to walk by herself. And so I said, I'll just go with you. And so I went and I liked what I heard. So next Sunday we got up and we went again and we kept going Brother Ironoth did a meeting at Shallow. We married in June, June the, what, 18th, I guess, of 1946. And uh, I was baptized in uh, July of 1947. So it didn't take me long to realize that the life that I was living was not what I wanted. And I thank God every day for making me that new creation, the new creature. Buried with Christ and the old man is crucified. The old man that I was when Louis and me married is not the same man that I am now. I would not, under any circumstance, go back to the life that I was living before. I love being a Christian. I love to attend the worship services. Even though the Bible says, not forsaken the assembly of yourselves together, I, it would not have to say that to me because I love to assemble with the saints. I love to be here and I love to worship God together with the saints. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Philippians 4.4, 4, if you want to read that. Rejoice, tells us what to do, rejoice.
tells us where to rejoice in the Lord. That's where we are because we were baptized into the Lord, into Christ. He tells us when to rejoice, always. And then he repeats that. Again, I say rejoice. So I hope that everybody here today is happy to be here. I hope nobody came just because you felt obligated to come. I hope we come because we love to be with the saints to worship God. It means the world to me to worship God together with the saints. My grandparents was caused me of being a Christian. My daddy didn't go to church back when I was young. So my grandparents had great bearing on me to become a Christian. I said a while ago I'd been a member about 72 or three years, but now I understand I ain't been faithful all that long. The two and a half years I spent in the service, probably a couple of years after I was out, I was married and maybe had Peggy before I ever rededicated my life to the Lord. So the church or heaven is so wonderful, beautiful. We read in Revelation 21 and verse 4, it says, And the Lord shall wipe away all tears, and there shall be no more pain, no more suffering, no more crying, and no more pain. So that's a wonderful place to go. On down in verse 27, the same chapter, it says, I shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth and make an abomination or work of a lie, but those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So we got to have our name written in that Lamb's book of life. On, move on over to 22 and verse 14. It says there how pleasant... Let me get my thought now. Blessed are those that do his commandments. They might have the right to the tree of life and enter into the gates to the city. So heaven is beautiful. We all want to go there and should want to go there, and I believe we do. And now we're going to have to live a life that's going to be pleasing to God for us to make it. So we need to all strive and do the very best that we can to make it to heaven. Enjoy those beautiful places, those streets of gold, water carries crystals, the tree of life, and all that thing. So we need to think about that very seriously. Herschel, you want to respond to that? Why you became a Christian? Why you became a Christian? Why you why you obeyed the gospel? Yeah, since I was a child, I was aimed, that was number one. But I kept putting it off, putting it off. I went in the service, and, and I remember going overseas. I promised, good Lord, if you let me make it, I'll become a Christian when I get home. Back. Well, I put it off for a while still. So I hope nobody do that, because you never know what day the Lord might call you home. So I'm proud to say that I'm a Christian. And I thank you all for the encouragement I get, especially my children. I mean, they mean the world to me. All of them are Christian. So I'm happy. Thank you. As they were talking this morning, I thought I could, I could talk for 50 more years and I could never tell you what they said today. And I, I, really, I really love and appreciate these men. And I'm thankful, especially that Dad is my dad. And I'm glad that, that I know and, and love these other gentlemen too. They've been Christians a long time. And I'm so thankful for that. And, and I guess, uh, how much longer do we have, John? As oh, long as I need, okay. 
Well, one thing I wanted y'all each to have a chance to respond to just right quick, maybe in the closing moments, what encourages you the most to continue to stay faithful in your older years? What, what is the, what maybe one or two things that you might could share briefly that helps you to be faithful in, in, uh, in where you are right now, okay? What helps you to, to remain faithful? And I'll let all three of you respond to that, and then we'll have a prayer, okay? Well, uh, my children and my family, and my promise to mother and dad. So I'm going to have to be, because I made a promise to them that I live faithful. And I'll never forget that uh, Brother Percy Harris restored dad. I'm so thankful for that. The thing that keeps us faithful is that promise that he made to us. When Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. My prayer is that one of these days that I'll be with Jesus, and I'll get to see him, and I'll get to hear him. I long to hear the voice of Jesus, to hear him speak. And I want to live the kind of life that he would help me to live so I can live with him and to hear him and to see him when this life is over. I'm like Brother Herschel. My family, I think, be the main thing that I want to remain faithful. I've got four children, but sadly to say, they're not all faithful. Three of them are, and one of them not. Of course, all of my grandchildren are not members of the church, and that's something to make you sad. And some of them, I don't know if they'll ever be really, to be honest with you. Sadly to say, they're in the Catholic Church, and so you know what that means. I've got one great-grandson old enough to be a member of the church, but he's one of those that's in the Catholic, so he probably will never be a member of the church. So my family is the main thing for me, and I hope the ones that are faithful stay faithful. The one that's not will realize this condition before it's too late and make his call and election sure. Dad, can you start the song, God's Family? Can you start the song, God's Family? We'll sing that. Can you start the song, God's Family? We're part of the family that's been born again. Part of the family whose love knows no end. For Jesus has saved us and made us his own. We're part of the family that's on its way home. And sometimes we laugh together, sometimes we cry. Sometimes we share together heartaches and sighs. Sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get to heaven, God's family. Let's bow together. Father, we thank you so much for the day you've given us, for the blessings of being able to hear this great lesson today. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and for letting us be your children through our obedience and our faithfulness to you. We thank you for Dad and for Uncle Herschel and Charlie May, and we thank you for their many years of service and dedication to you. For so many more who have been longtime Christians here at Atlas, for those who are just newborns as your children for all who are faithful here we thank you 
uh, Lord, for each person, for each man and woman, boy and girl. Father, we pray that you'd help us to love you more, to care more about others, and to share the things that you've given us. And as we impact the lives of those that we come in contact with, may it be a positive influence for your son, Jesus Christ, and him crucified. Bless us as we dismiss this class, as we prepare our hearts and minds for our worship today. We thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to be in this place with these people. Help us to love each other every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.